Hey there. This video is gonna be a deep dive and menu walkthrough for the Sony a7C Mark II for shooting video. Now I do have to say that this video is sponsored by Audio. We'll talk more about them later. And I also have to have a huge thank you to b &H Photo who lent me this camera to test, review, and make videos like this for all of you. They've been a huge supporter of the channel and they allow me to have access to gear so I can make these cool videos. So I buy a lot of my stuff from b &H. If you're looking to pick up some camera gear, please go check them out. There are links in the description, not only for the a7C Mark II, but all the cameras and gear that I use on a regular basis. So. I'll be talking about video specifically in this video. I'm not gonna be covering any photography stuff because that's not really what I do. Also, I have to say that there are lots of ways to set up cameras. These are just how I like to set up Sony cameras. I've used pretty much every Sony camera out there and I've made several videos about how to set up Sony cameras as well if you're looking for a different uh, camera to set up. So this is just how I do it. Um, and what we're gonna try to do is get the best possible image quality out of the camera. So we'll be shooting in manual mode, shooting in log, all that kind of stuff. And as I go through the menu system, I will try to explain all the little pieces so that you understand what all the options are. And if I do skip over something, it's because I just leave it set to the default settings. Okay, first things first with your A7C Mark II is make sure that you are set to video mode over here. Now this little dial here will go from photo to video to S and Q. Make sure you're set on video because we'll be focusing on video throughout this video. We will also talk about S and Q during this video because that has to do with video as well. So make sure you set it to video. Also make sure you set this top dial to M for manual because we're gonna be shooting in manual mode to get the best possible image quality out of the A7C Mark II. Now, before we dive into the menus, I do need to take a minute to talk about today's video sponsor, which is Audio. If you haven't heard of Audio, it's a musicing licensing platform. Now, Audio reached out to me a while ago and like usual on this channel, I have to actually use and like a product before I would recommend it to you. I have been using their music in several of my videos recently and have been really enjoying it. Now, when Audio and I first started talking, they didn't have the similar song feature, which I was used to in other licensing platforms, but they heard that request from me and other people and added that in, so that's really cool. They also added this new Link Match AI feature where you can add a link from Spotify, TikTok, YouTube, etc., and it will find similar songs. In general, it's very easy to navigate their catalog and find music. So for example, I like using chill and no vocals. They also have a catalog of sound effects that you can use. They have several plans, including the Pro Plan, which allows you to use the music for personal and client projects, as well as have access to the new Link Match AI feature. And at the time of recording this, it's only $99 per year. So if you're interested, please click on the link in the description and use the coupon code below for further discounts. And thank you to Audio for sponsoring this video. Let's get into the menus. All right, so here we are in the camera and I have reinitialized the camera. So this is how the camera comes when you get it. So if you wanna reset it and start over or you're just getting a new camera, this is how it comes. And I'll go through exactly what to set up here. So uh, first of all, letting you choose the language, we will choose English. We will not do this now. Yes, I understand. Uh, we will not connect. Uh, okay, enter date and time, sure. Uh, I'm not gonna actually set this up right now, but actually the time of recording this, it's March 14th, 2024. Okay, whatever. Uh, so this is important. So this is allowing you to set the auto power off temp to high. This is super important. I'm so glad Sony has started adding this into the setup screen at the beginning, because if you don't set this to high, your camera will definitely overheat. So please make sure you set this now. I'll also show you where you can set it later. Uh, but make sure you set this, this is super important. So yes, we're gonna hit set. It gives you a warning that the camera might get warmer. That is okay. Give me some instructions about the swipe uh, features on the touch screen, which I don't use, but anyways, they're there. All right, here we go. We're in the camera now and we're gonna get started. So we're gonna be going into the menu here and we're gonna be going through the entire menu. But before I start doing that, I just wanna mention that I am using firmware version 1.01. .01. So if you're watching this later, just keep that in mind. I'm using firmware 1.01, .01, which is current at the time of recording this. Okay, we're gonna start at the top and work our way down. Now on the left-hand side here, we have all different folders and inside of all of those, we have other folders. And then over here, we have all of the menu items. And you can see also see over here, there's a page indicator. So page four out of 56, and so on. So those are different page indicators over here. So just a good way to navigate around. I just wanna point that out. So starting at the top here, we have the My Menu. And what this allows you to do is add in any menu items into here so you can quickly access them. I really don't use this much anymore because of the way that the new Sony uh, menus are set up. But I will talk about this a little bit later because there's two different ways of adding stuff into this. If you wanna set up your own custom My Menu, it can be really helpful. So 
This, the second one down is the main menu and there's two pages. And this is one of the coolest things that Sony has done in their menus in the last several years with their newer cameras. This has sort of made the Sony menus work so much better. I really don't have any complaints about them anymore. And the other thing here is that most of the things you need to access are actually in here. So you don't have to dive into the menu very much. I don't even really use the function button much anymore. So pretty much everything's in here. So let's go through this because this is gonna be the most important thing that you need for this camera. Okay, so let's go through all these and set this up. So first of all, I'm gonna set this to 24 frames per second because that is my uh, frame rate that I like the best is 24 frames per second. Of course, set however you want. We will set up the shutter speed to be double the frame rate. So we're gonna set this to uh, one over 50. And moving over here, the aperture, we can set that to whatever we want as we're filming. The ISO, never leave it on auto ISO. We're gonna be doing this all in manual mode. We're gonna set this to ISO 800, which is the base ISO for S-Log3. The next one here is the white balance. So don't use auto white balance. When you're shooting in log, you need to set your white balance manually. So make make sure you set it to something, either a custom white balance or you know one of the, the presets in here. I'm gonna just leave it on sunny for right now. So picture profile off, this is where you select your picture profiles. And probably a lot of you are familiar with this. And a lot of people were wondering about what happened to PP7, 8, and 9. Those are originally the log profiles and Sony wants you accessing it a different way at this point. You can still access it through here, but it's not what they recommend. So one of the common things that people like is PP11, picture profile 11, which is a cine tone. So if you want that, you can come in here and select that. But for what we're gonna be doing, we're just gonna leave this for, it doesn't matter, we're gonna be shooting log anyways, but I'm just gonna set it to picture profile off. Coming down here are the file formats and there's a few different options. Of course, I recommend shooting in 4K. There are three different options. There is the XABC HS 4K, which is what I recommend. That's an H.265 long op codec. So it's gonna give you really good image quality with uh, a good amount of compression. The reason we may not want to use this is that if you have an older computer, but if any of the M1, M2, M3 Mac should handle this without a problem, uh, and it gives you really good image quality for a good file size. The next one is the XABC S4K, which is an H.264 long op codec. So what that'll allow your computer to edit a little bit better, but it's still a long op uh, codec. And then the other one is the XABC SI4K. That's an all intro codec, H.264, really easy for your computer to edit and it actually records every single frame. But what I recommend for most people in most situations is the HS4K. So I'm gonna set it to that. Now, next to that, we have the different record settings. This is gonna be your uh, bit rate and bit depth. So please set this to the highest one. You want the 100 uh, megabits per second. That's not megabytes, megabits per second. There's eight bits in a byte. And 422.10 bit. So make sure you select that one. And it gives you the warning here about that, but we I already talked to you about that. So that's what you wanna choose. For the gamma display assist here, um, you can leave it on or off. It doesn't really matter. Um, we can turn it on, but we're gonna be using the uh, the display LUT instead. The assist auto, leave this on auto, but you could manually change it. But this one, you are in S-Log3, it knows to use the S-Log3 uh, view assist. In terms of proxy recording, I don't recommend proxy recording. Like I said before, most computers, most modern computers now can handle all the codecs in this camera, so I just leave proxy recording off. In terms of the wind noise reduction, I turn this off. I don't want the camera doing any audio processing. It's best to tackle this with physical things like dead cats and getting the mic closer to somebody, getting out of the wind, that sort of stuff. If you need to do some post-production, you can do that in post uh, for the audio. This is how you uh, change the audio level. You'll be doing that manually, so you're gonna set this to whatever you need to based on the conditions, the microphone, the subject, all that kind of stuff. So that's the first page. And scrolling down to the second page, we have a few more options here. And so we have log shooting. So I am going to turn log shooting on. And this only gives you the option of flexible ISO. Now in the FX3, FX30, you also have the option of Cine EI. They give you the same image, but it's just a different way of shooting. So make sure you turn this on. Flexible ISO, it'll work just like any other camera before with ISO and aperture and shutter speed and all that kind of stuff. Now for the color gamut, there's a, there's two different options in here. The one I recommend is S gamut 3 Cine S-Log3. So that is the color gamut, the S gamut 3 Cine. Now the embed LUT file, I think there's a little bit of confusion about this. This does not bake the LUT into the image. All that this does is it includes 
which LUT you are viewing it with when you were recording, and then it saves that as metadata. So if you bring this into um, the Sony software, then it will say like, hey, you know, whoever was filming this was recording this with this LUT, so they know which LUT to apply or that sort of thing. So there's no harm in leaving it on. It does not bake it into the image, so you can just leave the embed LUT file on. That's fine. So over here, we have the option of doing APS-C and Super 35 shooting. If you leave it on auto, which is default to, what that will do is this will, um, if you put a Super 35 or APS-C lens on here, it will crop in automatically. I just leave this off because I'm gonna be using full frame lenses on this camera, but I can shoot in Super 35 mode if I wanna punch in. So we can set that to on and that will put a crop on this. This has a 7K oversampled 4K sensor in 4K24 and 4K30, and then it crops in at 4K60. So if you're in 4K24, 4K30, and you wanna crop in, like get more reach on your lens, it will give you, I think it's a 4.6K oversample, still a really nice image. So you can turn that on manually here. This is where you format your card. I'm not gonna do that right now, but that's where you format it. This is the shoot mode M. It's gonna give you an error here, and that's controlled by the dial on the top, which we already set to M. Next here are the file settings. And for this, uh, the one thing I like to do here is I need I like to come in here and change the title. And the reason for this is that I have multiple cameras and I really like it when you uh, have the, the file be actually the name of the camera. So when you bring it into the computer, you know exactly what it is. So I'm just gonna set this to A7. You can set this to whatever you want, of course. We'll set this to A7C2. Uh, with an underscore. So now when you bring this into the computer, it will say A7C2, and the way we have to make sure we change this is file name format, we change this from standard to title. You can see at the bottom there, it says A7C2 underscore and then a number. So when you bring it to your computer, it will say that. That's a huge advantage for me, I really like that. This is the stabilization, there are three different modes. There's the off, which is no stabilization, standard, which is the physical sensor shift, sh sensor shift stabilization, and then active applies a digital stabilization on top of the physical sensor shift stabilization. I recommend leaving it on standard for most situations. This is the continuous or autofocus selection. So if you have a lens that does not have a manual focus switch on it, you can set that here. We'll leave this on autofocus for right now. Over here, we have the focus area. You can dial this in to whatever you want. There are different options from zone to center fix, spot, um, and sorry, expandable spot. I leave it on wide because the autofocus is so good in this camera that it just works really well. Subject recognition, leave that on. And then for subject, I'm gonna be choosing human, but of course, set it up for whatever you're shooting. There are lots of different options in here. So now that we're done with this main menu and we've changed this to shooting in log, like I said, if we go back to the first page here, you can see what was the gamma display assist here is now a LUT on and off option. So that's what I was saying is when you put this into the log shooting mode, you can use a LUT and there are built-in LUTs. You can also load LUTs, which I'll talk about later. So just wanna point out that when you put that in flexible ISO, the first page changed a little bit, but otherwise you're ready to go here, let's move on. All right, so a lot of the things that we'll see as we go through the menu, we've already seen in the actual main menu, but I'm gonna show you where they are and talk about them a little bit more in depth if I need to. So first of all, file format, we already talked about this, XAVC HS 4K, movie settings, uh, you can change the frame rate here, and you can also uh, change the bit rate and bit depth, which we already went over all this stuff. S and Q, let's talk about S and Q. S and Q is, stands for slow and quick. So I really like Sony's implementation of this. This allows you to do slow motion and time lapses in the same feature. They also have added in the last few cameras the time lapse settings, so we will talk about both of these. So first of all, let's talk about S and Q. Now, when you go into S and Q here, there's a few different options. Let's change our record setting to, of course, the max 100 megabits per second, 4 to 2, 10 bit. That is how it's gonna actually store the data in the camera. Now, if you go to the frame rate settings, you have a few different options here. First of all, you have the recording frame rate, which is how the camera is gonna record the file. And then over here is the S and Q frame rate. That's how the camera's capturing the image. So as it's set up right now, it's gonna record the image at 60 frames per second, but record it in 24 frames per second. So if you see at the bottom, it says times 2.5 slow motion. Basically, it's gonna slow it down by two and a half times in your camera. So you can also set the camera to 60 frames per second and record it that way and then slow it down in post. There's pros and cons of both ways. 
If you shoot in S and Q, there's a couple of benefits. The first of which is that you don't have to then slow it down your computer, it's already slowed down. Also, if you play it back on the camera, just to check and see what it looks like, it's already slowed down. So if you have a client or you're just curious what it actually looks like in slow motion, you can do that right then and there. The negatives are it doesn't record sound in S&Q, so if you need the sound, and also if you want to play it back at full speed, you don't have that option if you record in S&Q. For me personally, I was doing a lot of real estate stuff last year recording in 4K60. I always used S&Q because it was one last step in post, and I knew I was only going to use it in slow motion, so that's what I'd recommend doing there. Okay, so that would be the slow motion, or the slow, what about the quick? So if we come over here to the frame rate, we can change this to one frame per second. So if you think about what happens there, it's gonna record one frame every second, and then it's gonna turn into 24 frames per second. So it's gonna be a times 24 quick motion. So that's a time lapse. So this is great. I would do this if I was doing a time lapse. You could just set this up and let it run, and it'll automatically be sped up in the camera, and it'll look like a time lapse. So that is what I used to do all the time. But now we have another option here we have time-lapse settings. So there's a different time-lapse mode, and I'll show you that in a second, how you access that. Now for this, you'll see it looks a little bit different, and it has 24 frames per second as the base rate, and then the interval time is the time in between frames. So instead of it being frames per second, it's the time between each frame. So if I actually record uh, a frame every second, that's what we had before, one frame per second. So this is actually identical to the way we were just talking about using SNQ for time-lapses. The difference, and this should produce an identical image, the difference here is that we can increase the interval time. So now we can go up to five seconds in between each frame. So that would actually speed up the um, the time lapse in terms of what it looks like because you're, take, you're longer in between each frame. So you have that option there. But basically it's very similar. You can use either one. And again, record settings changes to the higher one. And the video light settings is if you're using an external light, I don't think that applies to most people. So anyways, I just wanna, go through that and show you that. To access this, what you do here is the switch on the top, we change that to S and Q, and you have two different options. You can either select S and Q or select time lapse. So you can go in and choose this, and then when you go in your menu, you can then go in and change all of your different settings, like we, uh, like I was just talking about before. All right, so I'm just gonna put this back into regular record mode there, uh, movie recording. Okay, going down here, we have the log shooting menu, and this is what we saw before. So flexible ISO, SCAM 3 Cine, embed LUT, we already talked about all that stuff. Proxies, we already talked about. Super 35 mode, we already talked about that. Now lens compensation, as I'm just going down through the menu here, there are a few different options. Now, I leave a lot of these on because nowadays with a lot of the modern Sony cameras and lenses, and also not just with Sony, with Canon and other companies, is that when they design the lenses, they are making them smaller, lighter, and a little bit cheaper. They have faults in the lenses, but the camera knows what those are because it's a Sony camera and a Sony lens. So it automatically corrects for them in the camera. So if you're recording video or you're or taking photos and you're in JPEG mode, you will not even see these corrections. They're just gonna do them automatically. If you record uh, raw video externally, which this camera doesn't do, but in other cameras, you will see it without these corrections. Or if you take a raw photo and then bring it into your editor without applying corrections, you will also see these things. So I definitely recommend leaving these on. This is part of how this system works. So the shading compensation is the vignetting in the corners. So make sure you leave that on. Chromatic aberration is the chromatic aberrations, leave that on too. Notice here the distortion compensation, they don't even let you change that and that's because this lens has a lot of distortion and the camera's taking care of it for you automatically so they don't even let you turn it off because they're like, we don't want you to see that. So that's that. Now the breathing compensation, I know this is a really popular feature, so focus breathing compensation. If you turn it on, it will actually crop in a little bit and then eliminate focus breathing when you're shooting video. So depending on what I'm doing, I'll turn it on and on or off. But for right now, I'll just leave it off because I don't want the crop on this. So anyways, those were the, that's where the lens uh, compensations are. So now over here, uh, we're just going through the menu, like I said. So second one over. This is where you can format your card, which I'm not going to do at the moment. And recording image database. We don't need to talk about that. Or display media info. Um, it just tells you what you're recording and how much time you have. Onto the file settings, this uh, we've we've already talked about this before. This is where we changed the um, the settings so that when you have it in your computer, you know which camera it's from. Shooting mode, this will there's two different options here. I recommend leaving the PASM mode here. Uh, this is what we're all used to. Flexible exposure mode is a cool little thing that Sony's done. It's kind of a hybrid between 
manual and automatic modes, but I just recommend PASM. It's kind of, it's easy to, uh, to use. It's kind of what we're all used to. Now over here, we have uh, the camera set memory. So basically there are three different um, custom modes on the top here. So if you want to set up your camera to do something different, let's say you want it to shoot in 4K60 or you want it to, whatever you want to do, set up the camera in its entirety in terms of picture profiles, shutter speed, frame rate, of recording modes, all that stuff, and autofocus modes. And then all you have to do is come over here and hit enter and it will save that into custom mode one. And so that's how you can do that custom mode one, two, and three, you just set them up. And if you go in there and you change it to custom mode one on the top here and you make changes, it won't save them unless you go in here and hit uh, one and register it again. So every time you go in, it'll go back to exactly where you're defaulted to. Now, one thing I do wanna mention is if you are in custom mode uh, one here, or any of the custom modes, you actually can't do a custom white balance, which is really weird. This is a weird quirk, but I wanna point this out because people always ask me. So if I come in here and I go down to custom white balance, you notice here that the set is grayed out and it doesn't let you do that in the memory recall mode. So I just wanna point that out because a lot of people ask me, you can't actually do custom white balance when you are in memory recall. Okay, let's go back to where we were here. You can also see here, which is grayed out, is the S and Q motion, which is kind of a redundant thing because if, let me put this in S and Q, just so if you guys wanna curious, curious what this is. Now you can switch from S and Q to time-lapse, but it's kind of silly because as soon as you put it in S and Q, like I was talking about before, you have the option there, but for whatever reason, if you don't wanna flip the switch, you can come in here and change this to time-lapse mode. It's, it, I don't know, it's kind of redundant, but whatever. That's, wh that's what that is in there. And that's why it's grayed out when you are in the regular movie shooting mode. Silent mode settings. Uh, I think I just leave this off for the time being, um, but if you wanna turn this on, you can go in here and make uh, um, exceptions for what you want it to do. So anyways, that's there. Release without lens, very important. Make sure you set this to enable. Uh, what this allows you to do is if you're using a manual lens, like a vintage lens or a cinema lens or something like that, this will allow you to press record without having an electronic lens. So make sure you please leave that on enabled. Anti-flicker, this allows a variable shutter option. So if you turn this on, you can go in here and you can change the shutter by small amounts, as you can see down here. Uh, this is really helpful if you are shooting, you know, like a screen or something where you're getting some rolling banding or anything like that you can change that. Um, so that's there for you too. So let me just turn that off for right now. Okay. Audio recording is on. Of course, we wanna record audio. Um, and so the level which we can access from the main menu. Audio timing leave at live and wind noise reduction you set to off like I was saying before. The NI shoot uh, audio is for if you put the XLR K3M on the top, this will light up and you have options there. So that's there. In terms of time code, uh, you can't jam time code into this camera, but if you are wanting to set up a time code in this camera, you can do that. Uh, I just leave this all default because I don't use these in this kind of camera. Okay, steady shot, like we said before, this is a stabilization. You're starting to see that a lot of the stuff in here is in the main menu. Like I was saying, it's really cool to have that main menu because you don't have to go in here and dive into the menu very often. You have the options here for off, standard, and active. The one thing that is in here that's important is the steady shot adjust focal length. So if you're using normal electronic lenses, you can leave this on auto, it will know which lens it is because it needs to know what the focal length is to give the IBIS that information to work properly. If you're using a manual lens, like I said, a vintage lens, cinema lens, where it doesn't tell the camera what focal length it's at, make sure you come in here and, and set the focal length manually. Super important for the IBIS to work properly. So you just have to remember that if you are using different lenses than the electronic lenses. But I'm just gonna leave this on auto for right now because I think most people are gonna be using electronic lenses on this camera. So that's where that is. In terms of the different zoom options, um, you can choose optical zoom only, clear image zoom, or digital zoom. I generally just leave it on optical zoom only and I like to do it that way. If I need more reach, I'll put it in super 35 mode. But if you wanna use clear image zoom or digital zoom, you can set that up here. And there are customizations for the zoom speed and all that stuff. Grid lines, uh, you can use this. I generally don't, but you can turn them on and off and there's a few different options. The emphasize record display, this is a popular feature. So let me back out of this. So when I hit record here, 
you can see what I get is I just get this little REC. That's really the only thing that's telling you you're recording. So a lot of people like to turn this emphasize recording display to on. So when I have that on and I hit record, it puts this red box on the outside. It's a little bit easier to see when you're rolling. So I'll leave that on for right now. But again, that's personal preference. A couple of different things in here, which you can play with some marker displays, center marker, aspect markers, safety zone, guide frame. These are all things to help you while you're shooting. I'm just going to leave these off for right now. I generally don't use these. If I do, they're probably, I'm probably going to be using an external monitor. There's a self timer option here, which I've actually never used for video. I've done it for, <laughs> for photo, but <clears throat> you can have it like, uh, you know, start three seconds later, but I just hit record and then do my thing. So that's an option here. Now, auto framing is really fascinating. I did get to play with this on the ZVE-1 when it came out. Uh, I haven't played with it too much and I haven't played with it on this camera, but there are options here for the auto framing feature. That's that AI feature where it kind of follows you around while you're, you know, if you're filming yourself or whatever or subject and it will it'll crop in and then frame around. So there's, there's some different options in here. I'd recommend playing around with this if you are uh, looking to do this, but those, that's where these settings are here. Moving on, we are now into the exposure section. So we're not using any auto exposure tool, so none of this really matters here, but if for whatever reason you wanted to limit your ISO to something, you can do that here. So there are a few options in there. And yeah, so we're gonna be doing ISO manually. In terms of exposure compensation, there's not much to talk about here because we're gonna be shooting in manual mode, so we're not using the camera to get, get the exposure, we're gonna be doing it ourselves. But if you wanted to, you could change the step from a third of a stop to a half a stop. So anyways, that's in here. But again, we're we'll shooting in manual mode, which I recommend. So not super important. Also for metering, um, this has a few options for multi-metering, center weight, spot, entire screen average, highlight. I just leave it on multi. Frankly, I don't even use the EV measurement on the bottom of the camera. I just use the histogram. If you are curious about how to expose and color grade S-Log3, I made a detailed video about that going through all the steps in different situations, and I'll leave that video linked down below. But like I said, I use the histogram and not the little number on the bottom because that is just the computer averaging, the computer and the camera averaging all the different things. I'd rather just use the histogram and make a decision because we're shooting manually. So I don't change any of these, but whatever. Uh, the white balance, we access through the main menu, like I said before, so not a big deal. And the, if you're using auto white balance, there are a couple features here that you can change. Again, I use manual white balance. Now, in terms of the color tone, you can see there's some things grayed out, like the D-Range Optimizer, the creative look in the picture profile, and that's because we are shooting in S-Log3. So, of course, you can't use any of those features. In terms of the LUT that we're using... Uh, if you choose this S log three, that's basically no LUT. It's just, I don't know why, it's just a weird way of saying it. You could also go back to the main menu and just turn the LUT off. But we're gonna use the S709, which is Sony's basic S log three to Rec 709 conversion. So when you have that on, it will allow you to see a little more contrast and saturation on the screen, it'll look a little bit more normal, but does not bake it in the image. So it's just a display LUT. The other thing here is you can actually use your own LUTs. And let's talk about that. So if you go into the manage user LUTs, you can actually import your own LUT. And this is a really cool feature where if you have a LUT that you use all the time to convert your log footage, you can actually load it into the camera and use it as a display LUT. So when you're actually out shooting, you'll see exactly how your footage will look once you apply your LUT. It's awesome to have that. So you can import your LUTs into the camera and there's a specific way to do that. Take your card, put it in the computer and put it in a put your LUT in a certain folder. The folder structure is private, Sony, Pro, and LUT. Yes, it's very specific and make sure you get it in that LUT folder. Also make sure that your LUT is a cube file that's either 17 or 33 point. So once you do that, put the card back in the camera, go to import, I'm gonna select the first one. I have the Phantom LUT in here just to, to demonstrate this. So if we select that, that will add this to user one. And now when we go back here, we can select user one and you can see it is the phantom LUT. So uh, whatever you wanna use to monitor, again, this does not bake it into the footage, but it's a really cool feature to have. Soft skin effect, please leave that off. I think it's absolutely horrible to the image. When I got the ZVE-1 to test and review, it was on by default and I screwed up a whole bunch of footage. So make sure you leave that off. I'm glad it is off by default in this camera. The zebra display, uh, I only use zebras for getting proper exposure on a gray card. 
I know a lot of people use zebras for exposure. There are several ways to do all this stuff. Like I said, check out that video if you wanna see how I do my exposure. So the what I use the zebras for are for getting proper exposure in a controlled lighting situation using a gray card. And for that, uh, what I like to do is set this to 45 because that is proper exposure using the S-Log 3 LUT uh, that Sony provides. If you're using LUT off, it's 41%. Again, I cover this in that video. So 45 plus or minus one. But I am leaving it off for right now. I will use this if I am getting proper exposure on a gray card. Anyways, again, go check out that video. All right, moving on to autofocus, manual focus settings. So we had this before in the main menu. We're gonna leave this on continuous autofocus. You can change that main menu and also if you have a switch on the side of your lens. So in terms of the speed and sensitivity, I generally have this set to three for the, the transition speed and three for the sensitivity. Change these around depending on the lens you're using, the subjects that you're tracking, all that kind of stuff. But I generally, for you know, for general use, I leave them both on three and it works pretty well. Autofocus assist is what allows you to grab the manual focus string and sort of assist the autofocus. It's a cool feature. I know a lot of people like it. I personally am just like all autofocus or all manual focus. I use manual focus a lot. So for me, you can turn this on or off and see what that's about. Now, I do want to mention one other thing while we're at this. If you see at the bottom here, there's like the, the trash can with the question mark. If you hit that, you have a couple different options. You have add to my menu, which we'll talk about later, but the in-camera guide. So if you ever have a question about what something is, if you're like, what is autofocus assist? You can do that and it will give you some information. So that's really cool. Thank you, Sony. On to the next uh, page here, the focus area. Like I said before, I leave it on wide when I'm using autofocus because Sony autofocus is awesome. I don't change the focus area limit or color. Um, no, I don't change any of this stuff. Okay. And this is the subject recognition we can get from the main menu as well. There's just a lot more options here that you can change. This allows you to, if you're never gonna like do insects, birds, or cars and trains, whatever, you can actually uh, turn them off so that when you're cycling through them, you don't have to see all of them. That's just a really specific feature there, but that's what that's for. Uh, if you wanted to specifically pick right eye or left eye or auto, you can do that. Now, a lot of people ask me why you'd wanna do this. If you're doing like an interview or something where the shot is coming from the side <clears throat> and you want like the front eye to be in focus, you could just pick left eye or right eye. So, but I just usually leave it on auto for most things. And make sure you have the subject recognition um, from display that will put the little box on the face or the eye. Make sure you turn that on so you can see that's actually registering that. I'm glad it's on by default. It hadn't been in previous cameras. Face memory, this is a cool feature I haven't played much around with, but it can actually register faces and then it will prioritize them in a group. So it's pretty cool, but that's the option there. And then you have the register race priority. I don't have any <clears throat> faces um, uh, registered in here, but that's what that's for. Focus mapping is a pretty cool feature. I don't really use it anymore, but it debuted with the a7 IV. I made a video all about that, and I'll leave that video linked down below if you wanna check it out. Just another way to acquire focus. It's pretty interesting. Uh, I just don't wind up using it very often, but it is very cool. There's options for focus magnifier if you use that. So, you know, this is like how you'll zoom in to, to get focus, which is helpful sometimes. And you have a uh, limitation on time and also the initial focus. So if you're using focus magnifier, those options are in here too. In terms of peaking display, uh, I use focus peaking a lot when I'm using manual focus. So for this, I like high peaking. It allows me to see it a little better. And I usually like red, but it will depend on what you're shooting. So just want something that's contrast to what you're shooting. So if you are shooting something where there's a lot of yellow and blue, then maybe choose something that's red. But in general, I like using red for most of the stuff. You can turn the peaking on and off here, uh, but I'm also gonna set a button for this because I do turn peaking on and off pretty regularly. And we'll go over all the custom buttons and dials as well as we get through the menu. So all of the playback and connection settings, I don't mess with these. I really don't use this stuff. So, But there's a whole bunch of settings in here. I just don't use it. For streaming, you can do USB streaming, but I tend to use the HDMI out to a capture card. So anyways, I don't touch any of these things. Let's get on to the bottom section, the setup menu. I call it a briefcase or a suitcase, but I don't know, whatever that little icon is. Okay, so we'll go through these. So area date, like we pro you probably set that up when you turn on the camera, but if you need to change that, that's here. Uh, and the language. Now the NTSC PAL selector, I get asked in every single time I make a video about this, Hey Josh, I can't see 24p or I can't see 25p. Depending where you are in the world, depending on what frame rates that you want, you might need to change this. I'm in North America, I'm in the United States, 
So I use NTSC, that'll give me 24, 30, 60, 120. If you're in Europe and some other places, you wanna choose PAL, which will give you 25, 50, and 100. So that's where you change this in the menu. This is where you can uh, reset your settings. Of course, I'm not gonna do that, but if you need to just reset the, set, the camera, you can do that here. Now, this is cool because you can actually save your settings to the card. So if I wanna save uh, all the settings that I have, I can save it in here and it'll put it on the SD card. This is great for so many reasons. One of which is if you are updating your firmware and you wanna make sure you save your settings, or if you have multiple cameras that you wanna have the same settings on, you can just pull the card out and then load it into the next camera. Or if you're lending your camera or renting it out to somebody and you know you're, not, you're gonna get it back and it's gonna be changed, you can save your settings ahead of time. When you get the camera back, you can load them back in and nothing changed. So that is a really cool thing that, that is in here. Now let's get into some of the customizations. And for this, uh, I'm not gonna do the photo stuff. Like I said, we're gonna do the video stuff. So if we come in here, uh, let's see, yes, which one is again? Okay, there's a couple different uh, folders on the left here. We'll go through these. So the first one are the rear ones. And so we'll start with custom button one, which is C1 here. I'm gonna change this to the Super 35 mode, which I said I use often. So that's here. It's You have to go down to the second page to find it. APS-C Super 35 full frame. So when I hit that button, it will toggle between full frame and Super 35. Awesome feature to have when you just need to punch in quickly. Number two, I leave that. Number three, down here, I'm gonna change that to focus peaking on and off. Sorry, peaking display, peaking display select. There aren't a ton of custom buttons on the A7C2, but for me personally, those are the things I use the most often, punching into Super 35 and turning focus peaking on and off. So those I do have buttons for. And uh, I believe this would just be the autofocus on button, which I actually do like having that. So, but it does follow the uh, the photo feature. Rear two, um, you can set these up for whatever you want. I actually turn these all off because I tend to like, it's a pretty small body camera. I, I tend to like push buttons by accident often. So I try to turn a lot of things off. To do that, you just go to not set here. So I'm just gonna turn these all to not set. But you again, this is just how I like to use the camera. So now if I press any of those buttons, nothing will happen. Now onto the, the next side, uh, there's the movie record button. Um, you can leave that as is. The other thing could be cool is to use it for like white balance um, because we're gonna set the record button, the shutter button to record. So we could change this to white balance, for example. So when you press that, it'll open up the white balance. So that could be kind of cool. So for the button on the side here, you can set this to whatever you want. Um, I tend to set this to the subject detection for autofocus. So that is subject recognition autofocus. So I like this because if you are using autofocus and you just don't want it to try to grab on a subject and just do regular autofocus, like for the whole area, you just press that button and it turns it off and turns to general autofocus. So that's generally what I like to set that to. But again, this is all personal preference stuff set to whatever you find helpful. Now onto the dials. Um, this has an option for separate for manual mode and other modes. Uh, I don't, doesn't matter to me, I'm just using manual, but you can check that on and off. Now, this is again, total personal preference. Now I'm gonna say some stuff here that probably people think I'm crazy, but that's okay. I'm gonna tell you how I like to use these cameras. So for the wheel in the front, I actually like this for shutter speed. And that's just what I've gotten used to. And so the rear dial number two, which is this one here, is that um, I'm gonna change this to aperture. Number three is this guy up here, which is generally used for exposure compensation. I'm gonna set that to not set because I don't use that for anything. You could use that for whatever you want. And then number three in the back, I'm gonna change this to ISO. So ISO in the back, aperture on the top, shutter speed in the front. But here's where I'm gonna tell you that I do something a little bit different. I actually turn the shutter speed to not set. And you guys are probably thinking I'm crazy, but let me explain here. Uh, I'm also gonna uh, turn the ISO to not set as well. Now I operate this very much like a video camera and I use a lot of cinema cameras. So for me, shutter speed is not an exposure tool. Like it is always locked in a double the frame rate. I you know, control my exposure with the other methods that you'd use. Again, check out that video if you're curious about how to expose and color grade S-Log3. But I tend to bump this all the time in the front and I look down and I'm at one over 30 or one over 
you know, 125 or something like that. So you might be wondering about how I change the shutter speed if I change the frame rate. Well, let me show you. You go into the main menu, which you're probably gonna be toggling on and off all the time. Let's say I wanna change this to 60 frames per second. I hop over here and change this to one over 125. Boom, done. So if I wanna go back, I just change this to 24 frames per second. I'm already in the menu. I just come over here and change this to one over 50. Takes three more seconds. I'm already in the menu to do that. Not a big deal. Now in terms of ISO, um, the way you can, I usually leave it at the base ISO. If I am changing the ISO, it's for a very specific reason. So I will just come in here, hit the ISO button and change the ISO. So again, I'm generally trying to keep it at the base ISO to get the most dynamic range and all that kind of stuff, the best image. So I generally just shoot at the base ISO. If I need to increase, like I said, it's for a very specific reason, I will go in there and change it. So back to where we were with the custom buttons here. Like I said, the only one I have is set is the aperture. But if I were to leave them on, as I said, I would use the front one for shutter and the back one for ISO. You don't have to set up this way, I'm just letting you know how I use the camera. Okay. Um, there are custom key settings here for playback, which I'm not going to change either. The function menu settings there, this is where if you press the FN button, I frankly don't even use this anymore because like I said earlier, pretty much everything I need to get to is in the main menu, but you can come here and change these to whatever you want. If there's a couple more settings you want to have quick access to, like you can see here, we have access to focus mapping and all these other, you know, you can turn zebras on and off and all that kind of stuff. So if you want to get in there to do that, um, you just press the FN button and that's where it'll show up. This is very handy. You can customize this even more. It's quick access. I just don't, I just don't even use it anymore because pretty much everything is in the main menu that I need to get to. Different settings for stills and movies is really important. That way when you're switching back and forth between um, photos and video, um, it doesn't actually use the settings from one or the other. So make sure you just check all these off. Yep. <clears throat> that way when you're in photo mode, you're not shooting in log, all that kind of stuff. So this here is all of the different options for what shows up on your either LCD or EVF. And this is what happens when you toggle through with the display. So if you wanna have certain things on, you can do that. I just leave all these on and this is for the EVF as well. And what I mean by that is when you hit this up button here for display, it will toggle through all the different display settings. So you can customize that if you want, but I just leave those as default. Record with shutter, super important. Uh, I think a lot of people miss this one. What this allows you to do is press the shutter button and it'll start and stop recording. So make sure you turn that on. I don't even know why this is an option. I guess some people like it to have a separate button for this, but I find the easiest button to find when I'm trying to start, start and stop recording is the shutter button. So I'd make sure you turn that one on. And yep, okay, keep going here. This is really weird because there's actually a custom key dial set <clears throat> under here, which is under what we were in before. It's kind of redundant. I don't know why it's in there anyways. There are custom settings for dials. I, I don't, it's, there's a lot of extra customization that I don't think you need for a lot of stuff. For AV and TV rot, rotate, it's normal, that's fine. That's the one I'm used to. That's which direction you um, turn the dials, which way the numbers will go. And dial wheel lock, we're gonna leave that unlocked. All right, in terms of the touch operation, I do leave this on and that's because I do like using touch tracking autofocus and I also like to touch a screen for a few things. This is completely personal preference. I find it's really hard for me to work uh, some of the touch operation stuff and I bump it a lot. So I turn a lot of the stuff off, but again, just however you like to use it. They did introduce a few other touch features. Let me just show you what those are. So for example, if, and this is that warning that came up or the information that came up at the beginning. So if you just swipe over, you'll get this. Um, see, I, I just struggle working this sometimes. You swipe up, you get the FN. I'd rather just press the FN button. So you can actually turn these off. So let me show you how to do that. So as I said, we leave this on. If we go down to the touch panel settings here under shooting, we can actually turn these off if you want. Again, this is totally up to you, but I'm just gonna turn the swipe right, swipe left, swipe up feature off. Um, that way um, I don't struggle with that and hit it by accident, but this is totally personal preference. I just don't like them very much. Okay, screen reader is a cool feature for accessibility here. I'm, I don't need that on. Um, and then the large screen. So there's some accessibility stuff in here, but I leave those as default. All right, some stuff to talk about in here. So select finder monitor. This is where you can have it on auto, which if it's on auto, it will use the sensor next to the EVF. 
So if I put my finger over the sensor here, you can see it'll turn the EVF on and off. So if you are using the EVF and you want it to be automatic there, turn it to auto. If you just want the viewfinder or just want the monitor, you can do that. Uh, maybe I'll just leave it on monitor for right now so I don't <laughs> switch off the screen in the back here. For monitor brightness, I almost always turn this up to plus two, but for the sake of this video, um, I'm gonna leave this at zero because otherwise it'll look a little bit too bright for the rest of the video, but make sure you turn that up because uh, if you're outside, you're definitely gonna need the help with the brightness. If you find your brightness, you can adjust that too. It's on auto right now. And the color temperature for display quality, I set this to high. And for the finder frame rate, I also set that to high. I want the highest quality image that I can get when I'm looking at the camera. Monitor flip direction, you leave that on auto, that's like when you flip the screen around, it'll automatically set everything up for you, so just leave that as default. So time code, uh, I'm just gonna leave this as default. I don't think, as I said, most people are using time code on this camera. Gamma display assist, which we already talked about, is not even applicable when you're in S-Log3 because you can use the LUT, display LUT, we already talked about that. Uh, there's a couple different options here which I don't change, they're fine default. So the remain shooting display, auto review, shoot mode selection screen, these are all fine, just leave these default. Now the auto monitor off, um, you can set all these settings here for power saving and stuff like that. I just turn all this stuff off because I'm pretty conscious about turning my monitor, uh, turn my camera off when I'm not using it. And I don't like it shutting down when I'm just like walk away for a few minutes. So I just both turn these two off. Um, and then for the last one here, this is the setting that I was talking about before. If you don't have this on high, your camera will overheat way faster. So make sure you set that to high. We've already done, done that. But if you were for whatever reason, you wanna change it, you could do that here. If you do change it to standard, it will keep the camera from getting as hot, like physically as hot, but it will shut down quicker. So like I said, leave this on high. Volume settings, um, I turn this, this up all the way and that's because when I'm playing back a clip and I wanna hear what it sounds like, the speaker in here is tiny, so I leave that up all the way. For four channel audio monitoring, that's gonna be applicable if you're using the XLR K3M. Now for the audio signals, I turn these off. Um, and so for that is like when you start and stop recording. So let me turn it back on, let me get out of here. And if I hit the record button, you hear it clicks on and off or beeps on and off. So what I like to do here is I just turn these off because now when I hit record, and stop recording, I don't hear anything. I think it's kind of annoying to have that on. But anyways, it's there if you need to, to hear that. There's some USB settings in here. Um, if you're having issues when you connect your camera to the computer, come in here and check them out. But I usually leave select when connect, so when you plug into the computer, it'll prompt you on the camera what you wanna use. Make sure you have the USB power supply turned on so you can power the camera over USB-C. Now let's talk about the HDMI stuff with this camera because it's a little bit quirky in the Sony cameras and I get a lot of questions about this. So let's go through this. So looking at the HDMI resolution, it's set to auto. If we click on that, we have different options. We have 2160p, which is 4K or 1080p. Uh, so I just leave all this on auto. But what's weird here is if we come in here to the output settings, there's a bunch of stuff in here to talk about. If you wanna record internally in the camera, right? Record media during HDMI output, turn to on. So if you wanna record inside the camera, you can only output 1080p. So if you need to send a 4K signal out of the camera, you cannot record internally. So the way you do that is you go over here and turn this off. It says cannot record movies through recording media. Okay, so that would be off. And then you can come out here and you can change your 4K output frame rate to whatever you want here. So that's an option. Now, for most people, I think you're gonna be recording internally and spinning out a 1080p signal to either an external monitor maybe to a computer for a live stream or podcast or something like that. So that's probably not an issue for most people, but if you do need a 4K out output from this camera over HDMI, that's how you have to do it. Uh, this camera doesn't have a raw output, which some of the FX cameras do, but uh, anyways, that's the sort of quirk that's going on in here. There's also a timecode output if you wanna send timecode out through this. And at the bottom here, it gives you a little uh, chart here to tell you what's going on. So we are spitting 1080p out over HDMI, and this is what's recording internally, which is what we had the camera set to. So all good there. If you go to the second page, there's the record control, uh, and that is, so when you trigger recording on the camera, if you have a external monitor hooked up that's also a recorder, like an Atomos Ninja, it will trigger recording there too. And then you have four uh, channel output uh, options if you're if you're running four channel audio. So let me explain this HDMI info display and some of the quirks that are going on with an um, an external monitor. All right, so I got a monitor here. This is my favorite little monitor. This is the Small HD Cine 5, but this could be any monitor. So let me plug in the monitor to the camera. 
see what happens here is that the screen on the A7C Mark II went dark and everything got spit over to the external monitor here. So as I work the camera, you can see it's working over here. Everything basically is on the monitor that would be on the camera. Now, this is beneficial if you can't get access to your screen or you just want everything on here. Of course, if you're recording externally, you don't want this because this will bake that in. So what I like to do though, when I'm using a monitor with Sony cameras, is I actually turn the info HDMI info display off. So now back over here on this screen, you can see what's going on here is that everything that you would normally see on your camera is on your camera and it spits out a clean feed to the uh, HDMI. So it's all black right now because this has got a cap on it. It's facing the, uh, the desk. But if I pull the cap off, you can see that you're getting a clean output over HDMI and you're getting everything that you normally get on the back of the screen over here. So that is the uh, HDMI info display. That is an important feature or setting that I think people need to know how it works. So again, if you have it turned off, that will have the camera act normally and it'll send a clean feed out to the HDMI. If you have this turned on, it will it'll black out the screen on the back of the camera and send everything over HDMI. And control for HDMI is good if you're doing the, um, uh, the start and stop recording. So anyways, I just wanna explain the HDMI stuff. It is a little bit quirky and that's how you uh, access it and use it to your advantage. All right, on to the last page here. And so not too many things to talk about here, but the video light mode, that has to do with the external light, which I was talking about before. Anti-dust function, you can do a um, sensor cleaning here. Also the shutter when powered off, I always turn this on. It gives you an, a, a warning for whatever reason, but basically what happens is when you turn the camera off, the shutter closes and protects the sensor when you're swapping lenses. I love this feature, I wish it was in every camera. I turn that on. Auto pixel mapping, uh, leave that on. It does some sort of way of calibrating the sensor. So you can just leave that on. You don't have to think about it. And there's options for pixel mapping. This is where I came to before for showing what uh, firmware we're on. If you need to update your firmware, put it on the SD card, put the SD card in the camera and you can go up to software update and update it. You can also update lenses this way too. So if there is a firmware for the lens, same thing, get it on the SD card, put it in here, you can update the lens. Serial number, privacy notice, and we are back to the beginning. And this is the My Menu, which I said earlier, I will come back and talk about. So with this here, uh, you can add items in here if you wanna access them quickly. Like I said, pretty much everything accessed on a regular basis is in the main menu. But let me show you how this works. So the one thing I do like to add to this is that HDMI uh, info display. So if we click on add item, we can go and find that. Let's see, it's probably down here somewhere. HDMI info display. So once we select it, you can add, there's six pages for my menu if you really wanna go crazy. You can add it to this location. And then when we are back here in the main menu, you can see it here uh, as in whatever you wanna set it up to be. The other thing is, like I said earlier, that if you wanna add something, so for example, if you want to add, uh, let's say focus mode, if you hit the delete key, you can add to my menu and it will add it in that way too. So it's kind of a quick shortcut to adding in um, things into your uh, My Menu. So now you can see those two are in here. So you can go through the My Menu or at any point, if you wanna add something to it, you can just hit the, 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 uh, the, the trash can and you can select it to add it in there. So basically that is a full walkthrough of the A7C2 for shooting video. Uh, if you have any questions, please leave them down below. Again, like I said, this is just how I like to set up the camera, but hopefully this is a good place to get started. Uh, big thanks again to Audio for sponsoring this video. Thank you all for watching, and hopefully this is helpful. And if you did, please hit subscribe. It'd be greatly appreciated. We'll see you in the next one.